I'm delighted to present to you our colleague, Wayne Allen. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. It's a pleasure to be among colleagues. <clears throat> I, I hope you can see here that because the topic in my mind is Davar uh, Shebu uh Olam, here I am in the uh, Shel Olam. Um, and uh, rather than see the, uh, I, I guess, the, the decor of my condo behind me, uh, uh, here I am in the uh, uh, the greater universe. Um, I hope that today <clears throat> I'm certainly not going to exhaust um, all of what I've written in the book, and I can't, and uh, and thank you for the plug, Bob. Uh, but in the section on rabbinic answers to the question of how do we explain evil in the world, and it's uh, various uh, uh, subsidiary questions, um, I list 13 rabbinic answers that I have discovered. And in my course of doing uh, Daf Yomi in the cycle, I've discovered yet another one. So if the uh, the book is ever going to be reprinted, I'm going to have to change the to fiend, uh rabbinic answers to the question. I'm not going to go over all of them. Um, I'm just going to see if I can mention three. Uh, I think also the three that I've chosen would provide you with Homer Ledrush, uh, particularly if you're interested in applying it to some particular circumstance of your interest uh, for the Amim no Ra'im. So I'm going to start out with uh, what I believe to be the locus classicus of the, the rabbinic discussion of good and evil, and that comes to us almost at the very beginning of Shas. Um, I think that if I, if I, if I had the skill uh, and if I had the breadth of knowledge, uh, which I lack, I would try to do an investigation of placement of uh, certain issues within Shas. Um, in other words, uh, when do certain ideas come up for discussion and does their placement uh, in terms of the Shakla Vitaria, tell us something about the organization of the Talmud. And, and here, I, I wish I had the, um, the insights of uh, Rav Halivni, Zecher Tzadik uh to assist in this. Um, because I believe that this is one of the single most important theological questions that we ask. The fact that it is on uh, the the very first section of Brachot, the actual daf is uh, Zion Amud Aleph, the passage that's probably familiar to one and all, and I'm not going to go through it. Had this been a session in which I could provide you with source material in advance, you'd all have it. But I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with the text, and that, that's the question of Tzadik Veralo, Rasha Vitovlo. And, and here it is, near the very beginning of Shas. Uh, my take on it, without proof, without evidence, and uh, without any research, is that it is a topic that comes up very close to the beginning of our study of Shas, because it is a critical topic to take into consideration. So let me walk you through a little bit of it. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the, the question, and it's posed as a question that Moses puts to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, why is it that the righteous uh, why is it that the righteous, uh, that the wicked, pro the right, the wicked prosper, the righteous suffer? It should be the opposite, and that's not what we see. And how do we explain that? Uh, and this is a question I think that we're all faced with. We see it all the time. Any of us who are in the active rabbinate, and we know that we're dealing with families who often will put the question to us. Uh, my father was saintly, my mother was a tzadkanit, uh, why is it that they died, and why is it that we see such evil and wicked people in the world, and we hear that they live long and they prosper, uh, they're wealthy and influential, and that seems strange to us. Um, and the first answer that the rabbis give in the text is, this is not a, this is not a difficulty, uh, instead, what we see is the idea is that 
the case where we see um, um, the differences between right and wrong, good and bad, uh, evil, and it has to do with ancestors. And if your ancestors have merit, then those merits should withstand uh, any kind of test later on. Um, and it goes on to talk about the idea of a completely righteous person, whereas someone who is not completely righteous, completely wicked, then the equation changes. This is what I believe to be the single most important Talmudic statement of good and evil. And it reveals, I think, quite trenchantly how the rabbis approach the subject. Uh, begins with the question, again, as I say, that is imaginative one, but it's a question that really is the rabbi speaking to us. Uh, it is their question rather than Moses' question, although it's put in Moses' mouth. And the question is not in the traditional formulation of the problem. Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Uh, because the traditional formulation calls into question God's omnipotence and God's goodness. But here, the question focuses on randomness. How can anyone explain why sometimes things go as expected, and that's the prosperity of the righteous and the suffering of the wicked, and sometimes things go not as expected, the suffering of the righteous and the prosperity of the wicked? And this is a much broader question, and it one that goes to the idea of orderliness in God's creative universe. Um, it is described as one that is designed by God. And here we see the world in which we live is much messier. Uh, the quintessential evil, as we gather from the Breshid story, is moral chaos. It's tohu vavohu. Um, but this... Uh, the existence of moral chaos uh, begs the question. Uh, instead, we look at theodicy, and that's the vindication of God's goodness in the face of the reality of what we see is unexpected. So the first attempt to answer the secondary question, um, God, as you heard me say earlier, and as you're familiar with the passage, invokes ancestral merits. The action of one's ancestors either enhance or detract from the status of the living. So now applied to the problem of the injustices in the world, uh, the righteous who suffer are suffering as punishment for the sins of their wicked ancestors, and the wicked who prosper are being rewarded for the merits of their righteous ancestors. So the neutral observer perceives the situation as unfair, but from God's perspective, from the greater perspective, uh, it's entirely justified. What's noteworthy here is that the good works of the ancestors uh, of the righteous do not gain the righteous any additional benefits. And the evil works of the ancestors of the wicked um, condemn the living wicked, do not condemn the living wicked to more severe punishment. So. Ancestral merits has its limited effect, but for the rabbis, this attempted solution, notice I say the word attempted solution, generates a problem. It contradicts the biblical doctrine that each person is held accountable for his or her own sins. We all know that from Sefer Tvarim. So consequently, ancestral demerit should not have any bearing on the prosperity of an otherwise uh, righteous person. So to resolve the contradiction, the Talmud suggests that the rabbis want to uphold both the principle of ancestral merit as well as the principle of individual accountability. And they do that by distinguishing between two cases, uh, one in which the living persist in the behavior of their ancestors and one in which the living do not. So now we have, if the living persist in the actions of their ancestors, their own action is determinative, and ancestral merit has no bearing. Second answer is proposed. God's response to Moses, a completely righteous person does not suffer, and a completely wicked person does not prosper. And the evidence to the contrary means that the person judged was neither completely righteous nor completely wicked. 
So the implications of this passage are as important as the meaning. It implies that the rabbis recognized uh, the rabbis as the recognized religious leaders of the Jewish people were sensitive to the seeming unfairness in the life they observed. And what this passage also implies is the rabbi's concern required postulating answers. Even second century Rabbi Yanai stated in the Mishnah, it's not our power to explain either the prosperity of the wicked or the affliction of the righteous is an answer. But Rabbi Yanai, much like the message of the book of Eov, holds that God's decisions are above and beyond human understanding. Now, I want to point out something about rabbinic methodology. There are two principles that are at work. First, the rabbis see themselves as the heirs of the biblical tradition and as what I call scriptural loyalists. That's a good thing to be, by the way. That, that is to say, they feel felt upheld to, to uphold the teachings of the Bible and defend the integrity of the text. Uh, that doesn't mean that the rabbis can't have any new ideas. Uh, quite the contrary, the rabbis introduced novel ideas, among them uh, immortality and immaterial soul and afterlife, um, chastisements of love, Yisurei Ahava, uh, the Yetzer Hara, but they fit them into the scriptural text. So much of rabbinic theology is rooted in textual interpretation. Now, the second methodological point is the rabbis are not discursive philosophers. They are not theologians. Uh, they are dialecticians. And out of their dialogue, uh, some practical and specific solutions to problems emerge. Um, and I think for the rabbis, the most significant issue for them was the question of theodicy. And as a consequence of the dialectical method, um, we would be hard pressed to find rabbinic consensus. And I think we see that in everything, a plethora of opinions, a general absence of resolution makes it difficult to conclude which opinion is probative, which is sequacious. So we have a range of information. So what I see happening is for those who read my chapter in this book, they, they tend to say, wait a second, how can there be so many different answers? Uh, as an appendix uh, to my book, I count I think, 35 different answers to the question of how do we explain good and evil, and 23 different answers to the question of human suffering. Uh, how come there are so many? Um, and the answer is, is because there is no consensus, and the consensus would be unexpected. Uh, most people come with the question that, that there should have been an agreement here. Shouldn't the rabbis, as brilliant as they were, as important as we hold their opinions, have come to a unified approach to a question that is so so grand uh, and so important? And the answer is no, for the very opposite reason. It, it is unexpected, and it's entirely consistent with rabbinic methodology. So where shall we go? to find um, some answers. So I'm going to suggest that uh, in the search for the answers to these questions or an, on answer, I'm going to suggest to you that one method, it's not really a solution, but a method that will produce a solution is to refine definitions. Now taking the standard uh, question in theodicy um, is how do we justify God's behavior if God is all powerful and God is all good uh, God exists why is there evil in the world if evil does exist as well one of those statements has to be false in order for the uh, logic to hold or from the question from the rabbinic standpoint uh, why is it that we see the righteous people suffer. We see evil people prosper. Um, why don't we start out with an approach that says, we really don't understand how those terms are used. If you come from the perspective 
that there is an absolute consensus on what constitutes good and evil, then in fact, there would be a problem. But how do we define good and evil? How do we define the wicked and righteous? So the first attempt uh, to look at a redefinition and therefore an avoidance of the problem, um, the way the logic works is if the rabbis can say to you, oh, you think they are wicked and ought to be punished. They're not really wicked. And if you think they are righteous and they should enjoy benefits and not suffer, they're not really righteous. What you understand righteous and what you understand wicked to be are not the way that God looks at or as we should look at from a different standpoint. Um, and one attempt to do that is a statement of Rabbi Yochanan. Uh, and this is a statement, by the way, that uh, we should uh, take a look at before the Amim wrote No Ra'im. It is in Rosh Hashanah and it's in Ted Zayin Amud Bet. And it's the division of human beings into the Tzadikim, Rishaim, and Beinoniim. And at the time of the annual judgment, which comes at the upcoming Yamim No Ra'im, the holy righteous are sealed for life, the holy wicked are sealed for death, and those in the middle, which means all of us, have their judgment suspended until Yom Kippur, which gives us an opportunity to tip the scales one way or another. So by adding to the number of good deeds, so says the myth mythology, um, we, the people in the middle, can enter the category of righteous and presumably gain being sealed for life. So, um, we hear this all the time. It's something that we probably explain to our balabatim, if you have balabatim. Um, but how do we operate here? So there's a certain strategy that the rabbis employ. Uh, for instance, uh, one can deny that righteousness means being nearly or completely sinless, or that wickedness means being nearly or completely evil. Um, so. Uh, Take a look, uh, if you'd like, at uh, Bava Metzia, uh, at uh, Pei Zion Amud Bet. Um, there's a discussion about Avraham Avinu and his uh, Haknasat Orchim. And Rabbi Elazar concludes, from here we learn that the righteous say little and do much, whereas the wicked say much and not do even a little. So this passage suggests that righteousness is measured differently than what was supposedly thought. It has to do with humility and industry. It has nothing to do with moral probity. And its opposite, wickedness, has to do with boastfulness and idleness. So on the basis of these redefinitions, it's conceivable to observe a person who is morally deficient and still falls within the ambit of righteousness and another person who is morally upright but boastful and idle, the suffering of this person is entirely justifiable on the basis of a new definition of righteous. What the observer had believed to be an instance of injustice is not one at all. It's an illusion. So by redefinition or by looking at things differently, then the problem is avoided. Uh, again, we have another passage in the Bavli, um, and that passage in the Bavli, uh, Rabbi Yossi Hagalili is reputed to have thought um, the good inclination rules the righteous, right? Yetzer Tov Shoftan. And uh, this is also in Brachot. It's in Samech uh, Alad Aleph Amud Aleph. So we're really dealing with tendencies. According to Rabbi Yossi, righteousness and wickedness are defined as tendencies, not as absolutes or as actions subject to quantification. A righteous person is one who tends to act properly most of the time. A wicked man is one who tends to act improperly most of the time. And the random observer is not equipped to make any judgment about tendencies because we only see things as they are in this moment what uh, the German philosopher Heidegger would call the Dasein, you know, the, the moment, the here and now. So it's the what is. 
in the what is, we interpret things as being, this is a wicked act, but we don't see it in terms of other beneficial acts that are performed at other times, this wicked act being an exception. The random observer only has limited information about a particular act at a particular time and doesn't have information about the remainder. So what the random observer sees as good behavior and worthy of reward may actually be out of character for the person who is generally wicked and worthy of punishment. And the random observer perceives an injustice, but in reality, what happened to the agent perceived as righteous is actually consistent with that agent's tendencies. So what I want to emphasize here, and this is an aside, um, that this particular approach is, I believe, um, a very useful one. And the reason why I say that it is useful is because it tells us not to judge everything that we see as evidence, as clear and present evidence of the nature of the character of that individual. So when we judge a person with kav zechut, what we're actually saying is that I am certain, if not certain, certain, I would say that I am hopeful that the per person's behavior outside of this moment that I judge to be lacking is generally good and I'm willing to give the person the benefit of the doubt. Um, and that's something that I think would behoove us all to work at and our balabatim as well. So there are tendencies to do what is right, and a person who is righteous is not one who is perfect. Um, the example that I like to give, and I think I once uh, preached on the high holidays about this, is uh, why is Yosef called Yosef HaTzadik? Was he really? If we understand the word tzadik to mean sinless, if we understand the word tzadik to mean entirely righteous, then it can't be true. Because that we know that Yosef was a tattletale. Uh, we know that Yosef, I know there are various interpretations we can give to this, did not communicate with his father for all the years that he was in Egypt. Um, so he certainly wasn't a fully righteous person, and yet we call him a tzaddik. By what standards? How does he merit the title of tzaddik when he wasn't perfect in every way? And the answer is because that's not what tzaddik means. Tzaddik does not mean fully righteous. It means that a person is generally so, uh, has a tendency to act that way. And there might be exceptions. Um, in philosophy, question is, if a person steals once, in their life, is that person considered to be a thief? Is the commission of one wrongful act determinative of one's nature? Do we say that person is a thief because he shoplifted when he was 14 and deserves no, let's say, holding of public office as an adult? Or do we say that that person committed an act once? I'm not going to press further and say how many acts need be committed before our situation changes. Although, by the way, there are plenty of philosophical judgments on that too. And looking around uh, the room, I would just make mention of this. This is a, uh, a famous um, problem for ancient Greek philosophers. Uh, how many hairs must you lose before you're called bald? Sorry to my colleagues out there who are follically challenged. Um, it, certainly, if you lose one hair, you're not bald. Two hairs, no. Three, no. But it gets dicier once you get up into the hundreds. But at what point? What's the threshold? And uh, these things are very hard to determine. 
they That's are, why we should well, not be medakdek kechut ha'sa'ara. Right, <laughs> right. So um, this is this is what one contemporary philosopher calls mushy. I like this. It's this. It's very mushy. We can't tell, uh, you know, exactly where it's going to be. So what makes a person um, wicked? At what point? How many acts? So, but that is the nature of this resolution. So tendencies to do what is right keeps you in the category of righteousness. So it's not a zero-sum game, as uh, economists like to talk about it today. Um, Rabbi, it, if I did one wrong thing, am I doomed? And we would say the answer is no, particularly if you do tshuva. But we would say one wrongful act does not make you a wicked person. Um, let's not get into subsequent questions. Well, how many can I do, Rabbi? Give me, <laughs> give me the number now, so I want to know whether I get a break on the next five. Um, okay, but um, so this is an example, and interestingly, uh, Rava in the Talmud uh, says, uh, based on uh, pasuk in Yeshayahu, "Woe to the evil, wicked one, for the work of his hand shall be done to him." So. This is a kind of technical question that results in a theological observation. The evil, wicked one. So that assumes that there's a wicked man who is evil and a wicked man who is not evil. How can that be? Rava's answer is one who is evil towards heaven and evil towards people is an evil, wicked person but one who is evil toward heaven and not evil toward people is a wicked person who is not evil. I'll let you uh, apply this to situations at hand. Um, we often have congregants who will tell us in moments of confession, um, Rabbi, I'm, I'm not a really observant person, but I consider myself to be a good person Is that all right? I mean, I don't keep kosher. I don't really observe Shabbat. I'm not in the minion. I don't pray often. But I give to tzedakah and um, uh, I, I support the needy and uh, all the other communal activities in which I'm involved. So this is a person who is... Uh, not evil towards people, how do we categorize him? Um, if you had to give expression to how you would describe him, um, here Rava's words have a, a particularly good resonance. So in denouncing the evil one, Yeshayahu implies there might be a wicked one who's not evil. So evil and wicked are not the same. And Rava gives us a suggestion where the difference lies. To qualify as a fully wicked person requires wickedness to everybody, both God and humanity. But those who are wicked towards God, that is, committing sins that are bein adam, uh, lamakom, are not fully wicked. Okay, so a very end before, of this strategy. Before you leave yes, that thought, before you leave that thought, I just want to, I'm thinking of Bill Am, right? Yeah. Who, who's only known as Bil'am in the Torah, he gets a surname in Chazal, Bil'am Arasha. Arasha, right. <laughs> now, if if we bracket out the story of the, the Aton, he actually comes rather nicely, if not downright saintly. You know, they can you can throw money at his feet, he will not be dissuaded, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, does that fit in our paradigm? Uh, I would I would turn the tables and I would ask, what do you think? Are there some specific exceptions to Bilam? Uh, maybe we're only talking about Jews and not non-Jews, or maybe the nature of Bilam in attempting to curse the people Israel um, was so anathematized by the rabbis uh, that he was called a rasha because of his intentions, not necessarily because of his actions. Maybe that's a solution. Wayne, can I just... There's a, oh, you got, no. what, is, 
source for the for Rava statement with Yeshayahu? Where where is that found? The statement of Yeshayahu, the evil no, wicked. Rava, Rava's statement on Yeshayahu distinguishing <clears throat> the. Uh... Um, I believe that is in uh, Kiddushin. Try Kiddushin forty a. I don't have the source material right in front of me right now, but I okay. think it's in Kiddushin Mem Aleph. Okay. Going back to Bilam. Yeah. Bilam had, there's the, that's not the end of the story because Zachor Salah Bilam, the whole thing with the, 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 the note Moab is attributed to Bilam. Correct. Correct. So because he was a, a seducer, or part, part of that, uh, that was considered to be so heinous a crime that he was a Russia, because he tried to undermine the purity uh, the, uh, of Am Yisrael. Yep. So I always looked at Bilam as he's someone who tried to subvert the will of God, where God says to him, you're not going to be able to curse the people and uh, go almost like a, a parent speaking to a teenager frustrated says, you want to go try to curse them? I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, you go, go, but it's still not going to work. And he uses his prophetic abilities and talents instead to try to support one of course, it ends as a disaster as he's uh, mocked when God uh, shows that his uh, donkey can see what he can see, basically, that you can't subvert the will of God. Okay, yeah, all of these are fine answers. Um, and uh, of course, the important idea that I'm trying to get across here is that by redefining terms, um, we make the problem much less severe. Can't eliminate the problem, but we make it much less severe. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, continue for a little bit along this course, um, and before I go to another one. Um, yeah, um, if you take a look at uh, Breshit Rabbah, Lamed Dalad Yud, it's a good example of what I call redefinition. The Midrash says the wicked are ruled by their passions, while the righteous rule over their passions. So the difference between the righteous and the wicked is the power of self-control. The righteous person is not necessarily defined by the performance of good deeds, but by restraint and discipline. Restraint and discipline are necessary for controlling the urge to commit sins, but they are not prerequisites for doing good deeds. So by this definition, a person would qualify as righteous on the absence of criminality alone. Conceivably, the person in question performs no identifiably meritorious acts, all the while never yielding to transgression. The suffering of a non-criminal so described would not be overly troubling uh, since this agent is technically righteous but not undeserving of the appellation. Okay. Let me share with you, I'm looking at the time here just to see. I'm going to share with you one more. Uh, and, of course, I direct you to my book if you want to see all of them. But here is one more. The inexplicability factor. Right? Why is it that the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? The answer is, don't know, can't say. That's the inexplicability factor. Okay. So we're all familiar with the statement that uh, there's no death without sin. Uh, there is no suffering without uh, punishment, right? Or, or sin, if you like to call it. On the other hand, we know from Yechezkel that each person is held accountable for their own actions. 
So serious violations are punished with death. The ineluctable conclusion that death follows sin, right? And as a result of that, we would have to come to the conclusion, at least uh, Rav Ami does, right? Um, that there is death without sin and there is suffering without iniquity. Right? So if death and suffering are not contingent on human conduct, asking questions such as why the righteous suffer, or why the wicked prosper, these are pointless questions because there's no connection at all between the conduct, our conduct, and consequences. Right? There's simply no compelling way to explain the seeming injustices of God, uh, the seeming injustices of people in their lives or God's acceptance of them. Um, variation of this approach is the assertion that God alone knows the reasons for the suffering of the righteous. Uh, God alone knows this. And I would refer to the very famous um, uh, story that appears in the Talmud. Uh, and this is in Menachot, and it's Chaf Amud Bet. It's a story of Moshe Rabbeinu waiting to receive the Torah. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the conservative movement or were ordained by the seminary, uh, know that this text is often used as a proof text um, for the idea that uh, Parshanut is uh, necessary and that there are wide varieties of possible interpretations to the Torah, which is then asserted to be a justification for many of the policies within the conservative movement. Um, and as you know, the story, um, when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Har Sinai, he saw that the Kadosh Baruch Hu, uh, was busy fixing the tagin to the letters, and Moshe was disturbed. Uh, he wanted to receive the Torah right away, and uh, God was delaying, and God explained so that there's going to be this guy in future generations, and Akiva ben Yosef Shmo, and uh, he is going to be Doresh Tilim Tilim, there are going to be piles and piles of laws that he's going to derive from every, I love the, the old Sanchino translation, jot and tittle of the Torah. Nobody talks that way anymore, but I think it's very quaint. I like saying it. Um, so what does God do? So God accedes to Moses' requests. Moses is so appalled by the circumstance. He says, I want to see it for myself. So in this great science fiction text, uh, Moses is sent forward in time, and he sits at the very back row of the Academy of Rabbi Akiva, and they're discussing Torah, and Moses can't follow a word. He has no understanding of the issues, um, and he's very pleased to hear that in one of the answers, it's a halachala Moshe Misinai, which pleased him greatly, that um, the, the justification for the practice is ascribed to him. He knows nothing of it, but he feels good that his name is mentioned. So how brilliant is this man? Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Kadosh Baruch Hu that you should give the Torah to him, right? And not to me. So, but God says, I'm giving it to you. Rabbi Akiva wants to know about what, become, uh, Moshe wants to know, excuse me, what becomes of Rabbi Akiva, and he goes through this uh, uh, wormhole again, he comes out and sees that he was um, martyred by having his flesh flailed from his body, um, and Moshe Rabbeinu is just dumbfounded. So he says, this is his Torah, and this is his reward. And what does God say to him? Right? He says, silence, I have my reasons. You can't say a word 
I know better than you. I have my own reasons. Now, I'm focusing on the ending. In most, most times when this source is, is taught, it, it's supposed to talk about the development of the oral law and how there are changes over time. And the Torah that Moshe taught is not the same Torah broadly understood that was uh, understood that was taught at the time of Rabbi Akiva, but I'm most interested in the last line. Uh, the last line says, "You are not privy to my reasons," says God. Now we don't particularly like this answer. Perhaps I'm speaking for myself more than for you because uh, we are uh, rationalists. And we would like to see explanations. We're raised in uh, uh, a generation or generations in which uh, we ask why, why should that be the case? I need some explanation and an explanation of because, or uh, you're not, I, I have my reasons and you don't know them and you can't know them is insufficient. Uh, we find that to be tyrannical, uh, dissatisfying, uh, we think that it is uh, irrational, and we would reject it. But the Talmud here uh, believes that this is an entirely fitting answer, that a God is privy to information that we do not have, and much like the outcome of the book of Eov, uh, we're never going to gain that knowledge. It's not the fact that we lack certain information that we will gain at some time in the distant future. It's only a question of eventually making our way to that point. Um, we can't explain, for example, as you may know, that in physics, there are attempts to give a unified theory of everything. Uh, we're not there yet, but that doesn't uh, make scientists any less ill-disposed to try to discover it. Um, will we ever get there? And some scientists believe that, yes, it's possible, we yet, so far do not have the tools or we do not have the data to yet come to that conclusion, but we will. It's only a matter of time. This is a question, this is an answer that disputes that. It, it's not a question of time. You're never going to get there. This is information that's simply inaccessible to you. You will never have it. And people find it distressing, but the rabbis feel that this is a a potential answer. As dissatisfying as it may seem to us, they picture that God's knowledge is not our knowledge. And as a result, there are going to be things that are going to be known to God and unavailable to us. And that is the nature of the world that God created. And we must live in it. And there's nothing further for us to do. Well, uh, I'm going to stop here because I, I want to allow for further questions and discussion. Um, I was considering uh, uh, sharing with you the astral influences. Uh, another suggested answer is it depends where, under what star you were born, and your future is wholly determined by astrological factors but I won't have enough time to get into that. But if you, you'd like to know about all those other answers, they do appear uh, in my book. And I'm going to stop right here. Thank you for allowing me to make my presentation. And if anyone would like to ask a question or uh, have discussion, uh, now is the time. Does anybody take... Um the position in Chazal that evil is an absolutely prerequisite, an absolute prerequisite for good to emerge. So for instance, um, I think example of uh, Gan Eden, right? Let's say a hundred trees and from this tree you can't eat. Why didn't Hashem create a world with 99 trees and call it call Gan Eden a glad kosher supermarket? <laughs> right why why do we need to have that one we can't eat is that is that is, is that perhaps the plan is that what makes the world a better place the possibility of evil um i don't know if anyone wants to react before uh i take a shot at it 
Uh, of course, I am not the uh, the expert in in how God operates. No one is. Um, so I really can't give an official answer to that. I will give you an attempt at an answer. But uh, Hevra, anyone have a comment that they would like to uh, share? I, only in the sense, uh, but only in the sense that I don't see that as being the point of that element that there was one tree. In fact, the achol tochal of all, everything else was the sense that everything was available except one. And I think without that, there is no relationship with God because then everything is permitted. So I don't really see that as a good and evil issue per se. I think it's about the relationship that God, what, what's the nature of the relationship with God at that point? Well, I, so, I was speaking in terms of, I guess, checking our assumptions at the door. So for instance, I'm sure we have all at one point or another taught the story in Hukat about uh, Moshe not being allowed to cross into Eretz HaKodesh, uh, presumably as a result of striking the rock instead of speaking to it. So once I gave a shiur, I think I called it David Letterman's top 10 reasons why Moshe couldn't go in or something like that, where I simply uh, re reproduced the 10 uh, examples that are given by Jacob Milgram in his excursus to this. Um, and then I said, I'll, I'll add a few originals, one of them being the fact that uh, contextual clues in the same in the same chapter uh, that it says Moses can't cross is the same chapter in which both Miriam and Aaron uh, pass away. So I said we play musical chairs as a game, but in real life, is being the last one left really the winner? You know, you to lose every last person you knew and love, all of your contemporaries, etc. It's a dubious prize. And secondly, uh, we're told with Moshe that he, you know, it was 120 gesunten stark. If you found out about somebody who passed away at 120 years old on the golf course right after a hole in one, would your first thought would be Sadik Varalo Rasha Vatovlo? Or would you say Broadway finish? Hmm. You know, sometimes sometimes we assume a problem when we don't um uh, when well, what we consider to be the problem is part of the design from the beginning. That it's the without the possibility of evil, there's no possibility of anything that could be meaningfully called good, and therefore evil is a nest is is part of the secret sauce of creation. Okay, so you know that that is part of Rambam's answer to the problem of good and evil. So he gives a number of different answers. Uh, Rambam first tries to minimize the problem by saying that there are different kinds of evil. There's moral evil. That's the, for example, the uh, mugger um, or commission of atrocities, right? People against people. Um, there's natural evil, uh, birth defects, tsunamis, and there's personal evil. That is overeating, drug abuse, things like that. And God's role is only limited to the natural evils because the others, there's someone else that is involved here. Um, if I OD on chocolate cake, right, it's my fault. Uh, I can't say where was God. Um, if a nation uh, attacks another uh, and causes a great harm uh, and uh, death, uh, it's not where is God, it is where is the rest of the world who have prevented it or why you, who allowed those people to be in power. So it's only in the case of natural evil. And even then, Rambam says, if you build your house, this is my example, not his, um, if you build your house on the San Andreas Fault uh, and there's an earthquake and your house is swallowed up by the earth, to ask the question, where is God, is a foolish question because you built your house in the place that put, put it at risk. 
So it was irrational to do, and you are the victim of your own choices. So he doesn't dismiss the problem of evil, but he minimizes it. The second answer that Rambam gives, and this is all in the um, in the guide, um, he says that you can't have valleys without mountains. Um, you can't have the good without its opposite. So if you think that compassion is an important value, then there has to be pain. There has to be suffering. Because without pain and suffering, compassion would be meaningless. So evil, as we would call pain and suffering and evil, must exist in order for us to enjoy the values that we cherish. So that is a Maimonidean approach to it. I came across yesterday, I was reading, I forget who said this. Um, I'd have to go back and look it up. There's too many things, too many ideas that are that are flowing through my brains these days. I'm working on five books simultaneously, so it's kind of hard to keep everything in track. But um, here was here the suggestion was, why didn't God tell Adam Harishon, don't eat the snake? And it would have saved humanity a whole host of problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you want an answer? Or <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I th but I thought that was very, I thought that was very clever. Uh, the idea here is people are by nature disobedient. So if they disobeyed and ate the snake, there would have been no temptation. If there was no temptation, we would still be in Gan Eden, so the world would be a better place. So it's only a question of, uh, and and as we well know, as, as parents and as teachers, if you tell a child or a student, don't do that, uh, guaranteed that that's going to be what they're going to do. Don't touch that. It's going to come back. But anyway, the Maimonidean answer is, as I describe it, twofold one. And I think that adequately addresses the idea here that there is a value to having evil in the world. There is a real value. Um, by the way, later on in Jewish philosophy, we have a, another perspective, which I also include uh, in the book, is that, um, um, that evil people persist in the world. They serve for us as bad examples. In other words, God tolerates the existence of evil just so that we can point to them and say, don't do that. There's a value in seeing them at work so that we know how to better um, arrange our own actions. Okay. If we just... wanted to use uh, Wayne's example homiletically. Yeah. I have sometimes an asara nisyonot nit nasa Abraham avinu vaamad bechulam. So what do we say about those ten trials of Abraham? Lahodia kamachibato shall Abraham avinu. What is the uh, what is chibato shall me? Yeah. Is is uh is it lahodia kamachibato shall Abraham avinu lashem? And uh, maybe the tests that are put in there are manifestations of divine love. Yeah. That the uh, uh, kind of a variation on the unexamined life is not worth living. The untested life is not as full as the tested life. Mm -hmm. If we Wait. if we if we were born in the penthouse, we've got nowhere sweet. We've got nowhere to go but down. Okay. Wayne, yeah. Can I? Can I? Uh, it's a an observation and a question in terms of um, uh, the work that you did. Yeah. Um, first of all, Yeshikoch. Um, secondly, the distinction between the theodicy and the search for explanations of how um, evil can exist and how suffering hap how. Uh, tzaddik Ralo can occur in this world is distinct from how we handle the answers that we find. Yeah, um, you mentioned you mentioned the dissatisfaction 
with the story of Moshe Rabbeinu being told shtok, mm -hmm. right? That you just have to accept the fact. <laughs> right. But if, if you if you look back where you began on uh, uh, Daf Zion in Brachot, but you go back to Daf He, which I'm sure you're you're very familiar with, with Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Chanina. And there you have someone who was a great Talmud Chacham who was suffering. And is ultimately the, the decision is, if I recall correctly, the decision is that these suffering, these sufferings are Yisurei Ahava. Uh -huh, right. Right. These are Yisurei <laughs> Ahava. And and when when both Rabbi Yochanan comes to Rabbi Hanina and when when uh, or to Rabbi Chia and when Rabbi Hanina comes to Rabbi Yochanan because one of them is sick, uh, he he says to him, yeah. These are Yisurei Ahava, Chavivin Alecha, Yisurim Ele, right? And his answer is, Lohein, Lohein Velos Aram. Right? Yeah. I don't want them, and I don't want their, and I don't want their reward. Right. That to me, I, I, and I don't know how how you respond to that when you when you or if you use it in in, in the book. I'm sorry, I haven't read it. it, but but that to me is one of the most comforting discussions that I see on the on, on the subject. Um, yes, because, that's in the category. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say because because it's an affirmation of our right to say, I don't like any of the answers, and that's fine. If Rabbi Yochanan can say, I don't <laughs> want it, I don't want the, I don't want the, and I don't want their, I don't want their schar, I don't want the pain, and I don't want the schar alachat kama vakama, seems to me, first of all, it's there in the Gemara. There's a reason that it's there. And yeah. to me, I find, I, I, I found that uh, uh, very comforting. Yes. So my point is, uh, this is in the category of not explaining evil, but in the category of addressing suffering. Right. So, and it is in the book, and it's in that section on um, Yisurei Ahava is a rabbinic answer, but it deals with the question specifically of why, I put it personally, why am I suffering? And the, ans the answer is because God loves you. And we find that the rabbis themselves are dissatisfied with that because they say, I don't want that love. I don't want that love. Uh, that that does not appeal to me. I don't want it. And you say that by enduring it, I will get a reward. Not interested. Uh, and I think that describes uh, more. I was going to say more than anything else, but I have to take that back. It describes a great many of our balabatim, right? So if if you were to visit someone who was um, a chole, and you would tell them. You know that you're sick is really a good thing because it shows how much God loves you. That's not going to play. No, nobody. It's nobody not going to play for Rabbanu oh, either. Thank you, Rabbi. I feel so much better now. And, and Dafka, the example is between rabbis. Yes. Right? So it's yes. I, 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 can I just one? I'm not so sure. It's true. It wouldn't play for Balabati, but. For some people, I think that Yusurim Shal Ahava would be a better answer than, than the second answer that Wayne gave us today, that we just don't know. It's we're, that, that That's God's world. I'm not saying they don't each have a place, and they have a place for different people, but some people under intense su suffering could well say understanding it as Yusurim Shal Ahava would actually be an answer for them that would help them through that suffering, much like we use the analogy, the, the following thing, a man is coming at you with a knife, right? What's the reaction? I don't want that. But if he's coming, if you could understand the meaning that it's a doctor coming because he's going to save you in some ways, but it takes a it takes an extraordinary amount of emunah for that, but there are people who live that way and for whom that would be, and Rabbi Yochanan's answer would be not satisfying to them. So I would like to... Uh, uh, Seth? So I would like... Uh, Ron, you're muted. You're, Ron, you're muted, so I didn't hear what you were saying. No, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Um, so, so I would like to suggest oh. that for Balabim in general... Uh, William's presentation really uh, lays the groundwork for simply being able to say to, pe say to people, it's okay to say, 
I don't know why I'm suffering. I don't know why someone else is suffering. And the example I give is when you have a friend, let's say that experiences a tragedy, often people feel a need to come up and come up. Because they inadvertently really go into blaming the victim. God is just, you're suffering. Well, you must have done something to brought this, bring this upon yourself. And he goes ballistic. And ultimately, as we've already said, the answer is there are some things which are just beyond human comprehension. I don't know. I'm here. I'm your friend uh, to help you not to provide answers. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in one of his books, wrote something. Pro, uh, he writes a lot of profound stuff. But he wrote that religion is not always uh, coming up with the answers. It's being able to live as a community with the unanswerable. I've been on the receiving end of times where people say something that's supposed to be a comfort to you when they're really trying, the effort is to really comfort, but they say something kind of stupid, quite honestly, like God doesn't give you more than you could handle. And if you feel in the moment, well, this is really more than I can handle. It's like, thanks a lot now for making me feel even more inadequate. I felt I'm already mourning. I'm already upset. Now you're making me feel like I'm not living up to the challenge in the moment. So uh, again, it, as, as we've seen, there's plenty of evidence within the textual sources that basically says God has his reasons, whatever they are, they're beyond our comprehension. We don't always, as unsatisfying as it is not to be able to figure out why, it's okay to accept that as humans, we simply have limitations and at least uh, olam, olam hazen, in this world, we're not going to understand everything, but we just keep going and supporting each other. Yeah, if I might add just very quickly, it's an observation that all of us have made at some point or other that uh, if in fact um, the four questions are not really questions, but if in fact they are questions, we know that they have no answers, right? There are no direct answers to any of those questions in the Pesach Seder. And we've all observed the fact that, yes, it's the idea of the asking of questions that is key it's not necessarily getting the answers or getting correct answers, but the process of putting the question forward is a very important for our own, own edification and development. Um, so in the questions of good and evil, maybe this is a good way of summing up, um, we ask the questions regardless of whether we're gonna get satisfying answers, because it's more a statement of where our minds are directed and what we are looking for. The assumption is that the world that God created um, is an orderly one and should operate according to certain standards. Um, and we expect those standards when we see variance from it that causes us dissonance. And therefore we look for the questions, but uh, we ask the questions and we look for the answers. But it's because we see the world as being God's creation, and it is a good place. We expect everything to work appropriately. So perhaps the, the best thing that we say is the entire operation of the asking of questions of why do good people suffer or why do wicked people prosper? It's all on the count of the fact that we 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 know God to be perfect in every way. He creates a world that is good for us in, because he says to Ma'od that we are supposed to live in this world. It's a recognition of the world that we live in as a good one. And uh, the exceptions prove to us to be the proving of the rule. Thank you, Wayne. I'm sure many of you will want to uh... If you haven't already, we'll want to uh, purchase this book. I'm thinking about good and evil. I'm just curious. You said you found a 14th reason that's not yeah. in the book. Uh, yeah. In the course of Daf Yomi, do you remember it at the very top of your head? No, but, you know, we're in Gittin now. Uh, we're near the end of Gittin. Um, I think it was in Gittin. I made myself a note 
as I was going through it and I was looking at it before the presentation today to see if I could find it and I couldn't. And maybe, so now I'm looking back further and maybe it was a nausea, but it's in one, it, it, it's, does anyone remember anyone doing this cycle of Dafyomi? Doing Dafyomi, but I wouldn't remember necessarily. You wouldn't remember it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if if I, I I said if I if I were to if this book ever gets to a stage where it gets reprinted, um, then I may have to change and put in the fourteenth. I just so. wanted to do a a bibliographical note uh, that uh, in the. Uh, best shrift in memory of Yosef Heinemann, who was one of my teachers at Hebrew University, studies yeah. in Agadah Targum and Jewish liturgy in memory of Yosef Heinemann. There is a uh, chapter by Louis Jacobs, the Sugya on sufferings in Brachot 5a-b. It's a very, very detailed analysis, and you may find it of interest if, the, if uh, you want to follow up on this. Wayne, thank yeah, you yeah. so much for very stimulating. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Yes, you're you're welcome. Presentation. Always, always happy, always happy to be a part of everything. Yeah. Well, you made the empirical uh, case for good in the world uh, with this last hour. <laughs>